view of um, the models for this class, the, the two main models. One is um, what I call traditional web applications where a client and server are interacting sort of in the traditional way. And by the traditional way, I mean um, every request from the client gets a response of a completed web page. We talked about how in recent years, um, a more interactive version of that, a more richly interactive version of that has appeared called AJAX, where as in addition to getting complete web pages, the client can just get back a chunk of data. And that allows for some more sophisticated interaction between the client and server. So it's not just all uh, an all or nothing thing, where they get back a complete page or nothing. All right, They get back a piece of a page. and the client can rewrite a section of the page. And it makes it much more interactive. It makes it uh, act much more like a desktop application. Those of you that have used Flickr, for example, the online photo service, know that a lot of that works like a desktop application. You can click right on a picture and add a note right then and there. I also know there's similar sorts of functionalities in Facebook and a lot of Google products, Google Maps and Google Mail has, has that. So really is a, a much richer uh, sort of interaction. Um, we, we cover this class again in three sections. The first part we're going to talk about pure client side stuff, more or less you, you know, using the traditional model. Um, not the AJAX stuff yet because you have to learn the basics of JavaScript before we can we can move on to the AJAX stuff. So we'll first cover the JavaScript stuff, the client side stuff. We'll then cover server side stuff using PHP. And in the last portion of class, we'll marry them uh, and, and, and do some AJAX stuff. All right, so we made a couple of points uh, uh, last time. And one of the points is, is, especially when you're talking a traditional model, where you're talking about getting a whole web page back, that the client side, pretty much no matter what's going on on the server, gets back a mix of three things typically. HTML, could be XHTML, but one of the two. CSS and JavaScript. And you can look at these as sort of a, a, a triangle uh, in the way that they interact with each other. All right? And they each have their own role. And to the degree that you can keep their roles separate, you get for much more flexible websites. From what you've learned in, in basic web development uh, class, the CISS 216, you should know the, the benefits of keeping the HTML and CSS separate. You can put that CSS in another file, in a separate file. You can have many pages linked to the same CSS file, so you can have your entire site have the same basic look and feel. And if you choose to change that, you can simply change the CSS file and your site's going to look totally different. You can do some great things as far as allowing users to customize their own view using something like that. You can allow for um, mobile sites to have a different look than if, uh, if someone's viewing it uh, on a desktop or a laptop. A lot of good things come out of that notion of having a separation between HTML and CSS. It's also true in JavaScript, too, to have that separate in its own components. Uh, but on to that now, uh, or on to that later. HTML, as we said, provides sort of the content of the page. And it provides sort of a logical structure. By content, I mean it provides the links, the text, the paragraphs, the images, the stuff that people have gone to the website to see, all right, the content. It also provides sort of a logical structure. And what I mean by logical structure is through the use of div tags or, or other structures, um, you organize your page. The, you know, the typical web page has a header area. It has a navigation area. It has a sub-navigation area. And the HTML code contains those sort of structures, contains that. So in addition to providing the content, there's sort of a logical structure that the HTML code provides as well. CSS is responsible for the physical appearance 
and also the physical layout. And the physical layout and the logical structure are linked. In other words, I have a logical unit of the navigation. The physical layout may say that it's spread horizontally across the top of the page or maybe vertically along the left side of the page or something like that. So the, the logical layout and the physical layout sort of go hand in hand and that's how the HTML and, and CSS sort of coordinate that between themselves, if you will, to sort of per personify these things. All right, and that's how the, that code is, is separate. What does JavaScript uh, provide to the party? What does JavaScript bring to the party? If you had to define it, you know, one or two words or phrase, yes. Functionality, functionality. That's, that's a good word. Interactivity. Interactivity. Interactive functionality, maybe, would be a good way to take both answers, being diplomatic here and adding them together. And the notion of interaction is, you know, user does something, the page responds. All right, that's what we mean by interaction or interactive functionality. All right. I suppose you could call clicking a link function uh, uh, interactive, but we don't mean that because that really is, is just requesting another page. That's not really interacting within a single page. Typically when we're talking about client-side scripting, we're talking about JavaScript, we're talking about getting some sort of interaction on a page that's already loaded. All right, and that's really what we mean. All right. There's three pieces. Uh, almost all the JavaScript you're going to encounter sort of has, uh, the template sort of has three parts. All right, and let's look at those parts. One of the parts is really easy. You know, I can probably tell you everything I know about it within, you know, I don't know, 10 minutes. All right, we won't even take that long because we'll leave some of it as a surprise to figure out later. All right, the other two are, are what's going to take up the bulk uh, of, uh, of this section. All right, JavaScript, sort of the template or the recipe for JavaScript is as follows. One, there are user events that are handled. These user events trigger JavaScript statements. All right, that is statements in the JavaScript language. Those statements use the DOM. The DOM, the word DOM uh, stands for Document Object Model. The Document Object Model essentially is a way to point to, a, to, to something on the page and say, I want to do something to it. Well, what do I want to do to it? Well, maybe I want to make the submenu visible. Maybe I want to make the submenu invisible. If we look at our MSNBC page that we looked at before, as I put my mouse over something, that submenu appears. Especially if you remember to put the projector on. All right. If I put my mouse over politics, which I don't know why I put my mouse over politics, sports, I don't know. In this area, that, that's not even a good idea. I'm not sure what would be fun. Tech and science. Uh, <laughs> all right. I put my mouse over tech and science. That submenu appears. As opposed to putting my mouse over travel, 
that submenu appears. Well, something has to be able to point to something on the page and say, this is a submenu we want to appear, this is a submenu that we want to hide. The way that you can point to things on your page is through the document object model, the DOM. All right? So is that the actual word you pointed at? Is, is then the, the DOM or is it the menu? This no, no the, the, okay. The DOM, the DOM is, is the mechanism by which you address um, things, elements on a web page. All right. Let, let's give an example, uh, a more everyday life example. How do we, how, how would you, how would you point to a house? If, if, if you want to point to, um, you know, my house, or your house, or someone's house, what method do you give to point to a house? You're addressing a letter. You want to point to that house and tell the letter, go to this house, essentially. All right? How do you point to a house? Well, you point to a house by giving a number, a street address, I'm going to simplify it a little bit. A city, a state, and a zip. That's the way that you address a house. That's the way that you point to a house. All right? If I wanted to do a Google map search for, you know, um, um, you know, someplace, a restaurant, all right? I would put in that address of that restaurant and boom, that would show up in Google Maps. That's the way, that's called an address. Right? You know, in, in normal conversation, that's called an address. All right? An address is a way to refer to a house or any other sort of location. The document object model is the way to refer to things on a web page. All right? The, the manner in which you refer to stuff on the web page. So really, the DOM itself is just a, a, a naming convention, if you will. You know, what is an address? An address is a naming convention. Could we have come up with another naming convention for an address? Sure. You could give the latitude and longitude, all right, for example. The latitude and longitude would tell you whose house something is. But the one that we normally use in our day-to-day -day interactions is address. You know, street address, city, state, and zip. The DOM is like that. The DOM is the addressing scheme to point to different things on the web page. So we'll learn the equivalent of writing out a street address, all right, we'll know how to write a DOM address, all right, to, to go and point to something on the page. Let's look at an example. And I think I have an example posted. And it's a pretty simple example, but it sort of brings together some of the, the more, um, you know, so, some of the, the, the concepts. I can see where the concepts might seem a little vague until we see some, some concrete examples. All right, I'm actually going to go and this will be our ending goal. We'll try to get to this one. Let me go and copy this. And I'll put a one at the end of it. because that's jumping ahead a little too fast. OK. 
Okay. Let me show you what I want to ultimately do, and, and we'll take the steps to get there. Ultimately, what I have is I have a little study guide. The final version looks like this. That has several questions. And there's a question, and you have an opportunity to think about it, and then you can click and it shows you the answer. There's also a show hide button that shows or hides them all. Or you can go in and you can hide the answer. All right. This is a case of interactivity, right? I do something. I click on a button. All right. That starts the ball rolling. A piece of JavaScript gets executed. That piece of JavaScript, one of the things it does is it points to something on the screen and then it changes something about it. All right. So let's go back and let's do this one piece at a time. Let's just make this guy work. The one button, the one answer, all right, rather than trying to jump ahead to do all this. So what I did is I took out the JavaScript on this one, so nothing happens when you click that. Let's look at the code, all right? Took a little bit too much code out. As we go through this, let's think of let's think of how each of the technologies so far serve their role. All right. I have the HTML that contains the content. What is the content? The content is the question and it's also the answer. All right. However, through the CSS code, I make the answer invisible. So, content in HTML, so that div is in HTML. The div for the questions in HTML, the div for the answers in HTML. However, through CSS, I make the answer invisible. All right. So, if I load this page up, I don't see the answer. The answer isn't there. If I view the source, I see the answer is there, right? But because of the CSS, it's set invisible. Put different, if I remove the CSS altogether, there, I see the answer. But that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to start out invisible and we want it only to become visible when the user clicks the, uh, clicks the button. All right. So, everyone clear on me so far? All right. We're now going to go and put some JavaScript in here. And we're going to follow our template here. First thing we need is we need an event. All right. Events are simply HTML attributes that call a piece of JavaScript, that invoke, that start a piece of JavaScript. They all start with the word on. All right. And many of them are pretty descriptive. So for example, what do you suppose the code is for the event to click a button? On, uh, well, not button click, just on click. Right. So, on the button, I can say on click equals just like any other HTML attribute, then I'm going to put something inside the quotes. All right. So the event is the on-click event on this one. All right. How many events are there? Well, you know, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so. Um, there's the on-click event. 
There's an on mouse over event. There's an on mouse out event. There's an on focus event. There's an on blur event. There's a on key down and on key up. How do you know all these? Well, if you look for JavaScript events, you'll find them. And for the most part, they're, they're largely self-explanatory. On focus deals with when the cursor goes into a field. So if you have a text box, the on focus event will fire off when the mouse, or not the mouse, the cursor goes into the field. On blur fires off when the, when the cursor leaves that field. On change fires off when the cursor leaves a field and the value is different than when it was entered into. So if I go into a text box and leave it without changing anything, the on change event doesn't fire off. If, however, I go into the text box and type something different in and then tab out of it, the on change event does occur. On submit gets called prior to the form being submitted. On mouse over. On mouse out and so on. Again, they're largely pretty self-explanatory and we'll go over a few of them and we might even look at some of the oddball ones you know, through the course of the section, but to start out the most fundamental one is, is an on-click. Do notice one thing, by the way, in this example. This is just a plain old button. All right, Type e equals button. If you remember your HTML, we talked about there being a submit button which sends the form to the server. This doesn't do anything unless you've coded some JavaScript to do something. All right, it's just a plain old button. Without JavaScript, it just sits there. All right, JavaScript is what really makes this one go. So at any rate, on this button we have our on-click event. What we need to do is we need to use Okay. Okay, I'm going to be back in, in the class in just a moment here. I just got somebody coming to pick up my son, so. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay. Um, we have the on-click event. That's what's going to happen when the button is clicked. What do we need to supply? We need to supply the JavaScript statement and the DOM expression to um, make this thing work. These two things sort of go hand in hand. If you haven't guessed already, this is the easy one. All right? Writing the user event is pretty easy. On something, do something. <laughs> the something that you do, as they say, the devil's in the details. That's where the complexity really comes into. All right. What is it I want to do in this case? I want to make this div visible. All right. Nothing else on the page I want to make visible. Just that div. All right. What do you think is a good way to point to that div? What distinguishes this div from anything else on the page? Yeah, the ID. If you didn't get it with that, I was going to say what identifies this div. All right. That's one of the reasons why, uh, again, it might not have made sense at the time, but when we talked about in CISS 216 about those IDs needing to be unique, this is one reason why, right? Because we want to be able to point to it and say, this is the thing I want to do something with. Just like your student ID is unique, right? Your student ID number is unique because if they're going to send a bill to someone, they want to sell it, send it to the right person. If they are going to give someone a grade, they want to give the grade, they want to be able to identify just one person. Same idea with these IDs on the HTML elements. I want to point to that thing and say do something with it. All right? 
the statement that I'm going to put in is going to look like this. And we'll break it down. Document get element by ID Let me make sure this works and I didn't typo on anything. I'd hate to give a beautiful 20 minute lecture on, on the incorrect code. All right, there we go. Let's pull up just this portion of the on click event. Let's just look at this. All right. Document. What do you suppose that part means? It means somewhere on the current web page. All right. Could be, you could actually write uh, client-side script to point to other windows. So it's not, not a dumb statement to say this is a web page I want to change. All right. So document, when the browser sees document, it says, okay, I want to do something with something on this web page. Get element by ID, what do you suppose that does? that points to the actual thing on the page. Is that a method? That is a method. The get element by ID is a method. Absolutely. So, you're going to see this statement or statements a lot like this real often. Because essentially what that says is point to the thing on the page that has such and such as its ID. In this case, the ID that we're looking for is answer one. All right? Which is exactly the ID that we want to change, right? So point to the thing on the, on the screen, or on the uh, web page that has an ID of answer one. We're going to do something with it. All right? Now here is, again, now that we've pointed to it, we have to say what we want to do with it. Because we could do a bunch of different things to it, right? That div we could change the color of the div. We could change the font of the div. We could change the size of the div, the position of the div. That div, that element on the page, has a whole bunch of properties associated with it. All right? We have to say what about it we want to change. All right? And in general terms, we can change one of two things. We can change the content of it. All right? Or we can change the way it looks. Well, 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 <laughs> getting back to this, we can either change aspects of that element's HTML or aspects of that element's CSS. Yes? What would you do then if you wanted to make the font red? Well, Yeah, we'll, we'll look at that. Hold, hold that thought. We'll come back to that in a second. But let's finish this one first and then we'll, we'll make it red. All right? So, this part of the statement essentially says point to the thing on the page that has an ID of answer one. What about that thing? We want to change something about its style. All right? What about the style that we want to change? We want to change the visibility. All right. And what do we want to set the visibility to? We want to set it to visible. All right. We now know two ways that we can set the properties 
the style properties of something, right? We can set it just in the style sheet, right? If we look at this, if we look at this page, we set the style to that answer one in our style sheet. We can also set the style through JavaScript, which is exactly what we're doing here. Document, get element by ID, style, visibility, visible. Now, notice the use of quotes. The double quote is used to indicate the beginning and end of my JavaScript statement. Now in this case, I only have one JavaScript statement, but I could have several JavaScript statements. So, the double quote goes at the beginning, you know, of, of all the JavaScript statements, the double quote goes at the end of, of your JavaScript statements. Within those double quotes, wherever I need quotes, for example, in this case I need quotes around the name of the ID, I need quotes around whether I want to make it visible or invisible. For those, I use the single quotes. All right. If I were to use the double quotes here, the browser would get confused and think that that represented the end of the JavaScript statements and, and it would blow up because that's not a complete JavaScript statement. So, let's look at this again. On click, see user event. That's how the user is going to interact with this. When they click on this button, what do I want to do? I have this block of JavaScript between the double quotes. All right. In this case, it's only one statement, but I could have multiple statements. So I'm using double quotes around the, the chunk of JavaScript I want to do. What does my chunk of JavaScript do? I have a JavaScript statement that uses the DOM to point to the div I want to set. Document, get element by ID, answer one, that's the name of the div, or I'm sorry, not the name of the div, the ID of the div. The, the ID of the div is a literal, right? We want exactly that. It's not some sort of variable or anything. Therefore, it's enclosed in quotes. Because we're already using the double quotes on the outside, we need to use the single quotes on the inside. What about that thing do we want to change? We want to change its style, right? We want to change an aspect of its appearance. And we want to set its visibility equal to visible. All right. Let's add another button to make the text red. What do you suppose that's going to say? What part of this statement is going to change and what part of this statement is going to stay the same? Does this part stay the same? Pardon me? Yeah, the button IDs change. Would this change? No. We're still pointing to the same thing, right? Therefore, if we want to make that text red, we're still pointing to the same thing, so we can use the same DOM expression to point to it. We're still changing an aspect of its appearance, right? Something that's controlled by CSS, so we put dot style. All right. What do we put next then? What do we put to change the text color? Well, color. yeah, color. And how did you know that? We haven't gone over that in class. Did you cheat and read or something, uh, the textbook? Yeah, because this matches up with the CSS code, right? In other words, it's not a coincidence that it's visibility up here and visibility over here, right? That's the same property. We're just setting it two different ways. We're setting it in the CSS, and we're setting it in the JavaScript. So whatever the property is up here, 
If you know CSS, you already know what to do in the DOM. All right. So if I want to make this color black, for example, or green, let's say, that's how I do it. Well, to change it, how do I do it? Well, I first have to point to it. I have to say I want to change its style. And what do I want to change? I want to change its color. And I don't want to change the color to visible. I want to change the color to something else. So we'll make it red. So let's run this and check it out. So instead of having, if, if you didn't want to have a separate button, you would change it up I in the CSS section? No. Because remember, we want to do this interactively. All right. I'll, if you wanted to do both in the same yeah. swoop, we'll look at how to do that in a second. All right. So there and there. All right. Now if you wanted to do it all in one swoop, what you'd have to do is you'd separate your JavaScript statements by semicolons. All right. On click, document dot get element by ID, blah 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 blah. Set visibility equal visible, semicolon. Document dot get element by ID, answer the same thing, dot color equals red. All right. And now that will do it all in one shot. Yes. Is one syntax preferred over another? Okay. Um, well, again, you, you know, in this case, you'd, you'd decide from a user interface level, do I want one or two buttons? All right. You can put multiple JavaScript lines on a single event, but normally what you're going to do is, if you notice, this gets pretty messy pretty quick. So normally what you're going to do, if it's more than one line, even if it is one line, you may call a function. All right. And that's, that's what we'll do sort of like the next step, is we'll take this and we'll, we'll make it a function. Yeah, your, your question? Um, so you said the visibility to hidden up at the top. Mm -hmm. Is that in a CSS? Can I do what? In a, is that in the CSS? Yes, I did. I mean, in, in a separate document? Yeah, in an external CSS, yes. Yeah, I just have it as an internal CSS just so that we can only look at one page. It's, it's just easier to teach that way. Yeah, absolutely, the, the external CSS is a way that you should do stuff like this. So what I'm going to do now, now that we have this working, let's make sure that it's working. That shows it and makes it red all in one swoop. We couldn't see when it wasn't red, so, but, so you have to trust that it was green. When it was invisible, it was green and invisible, not red and invisible. All right. This is very, very, very hard to read. All right. This is even hard to read for me because of all, the way all the quotes and, and all that goes. And, and granted, I have the size of the, the font big. Um, you know, to, to illustrate on the screen, but even though, even then, even if I made it smaller, it'd be hard to like, get a picture of everything all at once. So normally, what you do is you take this code and you make a function for it. All right, and there's a couple good reasons for us to go and do that. One good reason for us to do that is, in this example, the advantage it's going to give us is that we can. Uh, see the code and read the code a little, a little easier. All right. Later on, it's going to give us the advantage of flexibility. That is, what if I add a second, a third, a fourth question to this quiz? I would be duplicating a lot of code. All right. And by duplicating a lot of code, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know you're, you're more apt to make mistakes. Um, it gives you more work if something changes, and so on and so forth. Um, 
I say this with, with almost all my classes. If I ever ask you a question why you do something, you should be able to answer that in your sleep. Because all you need to do is just shout out maintainability. Why do we put things in functions? Maintainability. It doesn't matter if you know how, you know why, all right? We'll come to that later. But that's why we do almost anything that I would say is a good practice to do, fill in the blank. The reason is because of maintainability, all right? Well, eventually we'll lead to a function with a variable, right? But we're sort of building up to that, all right? Now, the other fundamental rule in programming is DRY, which is do not repeat yourself, all right? So anytime you see code repeated over and over and over again, you should get suspicious, all right? Even if it's not exactly the same code, if it just has a slight variance, it should be a tip off to you, hey, I can probably do this better. Yes. Oh, okay. Looked like you had your hand raised. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put this up in a function, not for the reusability aspect of it, at least not yet, but for the um, uh, readability aspect of it. So my JavaScript functions are going to appear up in my... in my head section, oops, I'm going to start with the word function. I'm going to give the function a name. I'm going to put parentheses there and for now I'm, there's not going to be anything in them but there will be when we start making arguments. And then I'll go and I'll copy this ugly code up here and instead of having all those statements there I just call the function show answer much easier to read you know you can have the statement sequentially you can even Put comments in. All right. You can put it on different lines, you can indent it, you know, you can do all kinds of things to make the code more readable. Why is it important to make the code readable? I was going to say, come on, what did I say two minutes ago? Maintainability, right? Code that you can read is, uh, the easier you can read it, the easier that you can understand what's going on and make, make changes to it. Uh, often, you know, you are going to be work, or someone else could be working on your work, all right? And therefore, they may, you know, the more readable you make it, the better it's going to be. In fact, even yourself coming back to something two weeks later or after, or after any period of time, um, you can find that, that you may forget exactly what you were doing or whatever, and therefore anything you can do to make it more readable is a good idea. So let's make sure this still works. Which it does. All right. I have out there, and this will be a good one for you to look at for next time. The thing that I say example for 829, that was probably a little over ambitious, that will be the example for 831. This will be the example for, 830, uh, for 829 now. But look at the final version here that has a couple of answers and can show and hide them all and so on. So look at that example. I'll rename them so that they have the proper name uh, in a minute here. I do want to talk about a few cautionary tale, uh, t uh, tales with JavaScript. One thing about JavaScript is it's case sensitive. So therefore, that function that says get element by ID has to be exactly like that. If I were to put in a D such as that, 
then doesn't work. All right. Now, error messaging in in JavaScript uh, can be problematic. All right. The browser doesn't always give you a very good error. In fact, if you're not looking for it, you can't really see anything. Uh, let me show you the difference on how IE versus Java uh, versus Firefox shows you your errors. In IE, the error comes up. Actually, we don't even see it because it's not showing the. See what? What's that called? Status? Where do you see that? Under toolbars. Oh yeah, I looked looked right past it. There you go. Right there is how you see that there's a JavaScript there on the bottom of the page. The little um, caution sign with the yellow exclamation point. If you click on this, <laughs> it gives you an error, which is almost equivalent to saying. Hey, there's a problem. <laughs> All right? It says object doesn't support this property or method. It says it's in line 11, character 5, which, if you look at this, and let's go in here and go to line 11, character 5, whoops, I'm looking at the right thing. There we go. Line 11, character 5. It's not really character 5 that has a problem. It, so it, it's kind of, kind of uh, not, not very descriptive, the error message. Firefox typically gives you better error messages, but it doesn't give them to you in the same way. To see the error messages in Firefox, you go up to Tools and click on Error Council. And that will show you all the errors that you've gotten since the last time you've cleared out these errors. Which might mean if it's been if you've been surfing for a long time using Firefox, you may see JavaScript errors from every site that you've ever visited. All right, what you can do is sort of clear, and then start over. All right, and then you can see this is a little bit more descriptive of an error message. Document get element by ID is not a function. If you see that, that you may say, of course it's a function. Let me look at my no. Okay, that's a lowercase d. All right. That's one of the first things to look for is the case, especially until you get used to it because the case uh, is case sensitive and if you don't get it exactly right, then, then you'll get an error. All right? So virtually everything about JavaScript is case sensitive. You know, if you have a, a variable capital X and a variable lowercase x, those are actually different variables. Um, likewise, uh, you know, function names, um, etc. All right, any questions about this? What I want to come back to, though, is again, and as we go through this, remember the things that we talked about in the beginning of class. Number one, the client gets this stuff, the HTML, the CSS, and JavaScript. The HTML provides content and logical structure, CSS, appearance, and physical layout. The JavaScript allows you to interactively change any of those things. So there's two ways you can set the HTML or set the CSS on the page. One way is just when you initially write the code, as you did when you developed any sort of static web pages. The other way you can do that is you can change any of those properties. You can change anything about the HTML or the CSS. You can change through the JavaScript code that you write. All right. You can address those properties and change them. In this example, we change the visibility property of, uh, of a div. The template for JavaScript is typically the same in most examples. I won't say every, but in most examples. There's a user event that occurs that gets handled. In other words, some user interaction occurs, and then you want to write some JavaScript statements that deal with that. Within those JavaScript statements, you will use the DOM to point to something on the page and do something with it. 
So this would be a DOM expression. All right, this is using the DOM to point to that um, particular div on the page and to address its visibility. All right. Where the fun comes in in this class is, number one, becoming proficient in the DOM so that you can point to and address uh, anything that you want to. In that regard, document get element by ID is going to be a workhorse for you, right? Because that does most of what you want to do. It points to the thing on the page that you want to do something with. Well, that's half the battle right there, or a good portion of the battle anyhow. The other things that you do, you get hints about based on how you code it in CSS and HTML. Like so for example this time, if I want to change the style to address the visibility element, it's the same attribute name up here as is up here. Likewise the color, same attribute there is up there. If I want to change the SRC attribute of a source uh, 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 attribute of an image, it's probably going to be document get element ID blah 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 dot SRC equals. So whatever you use in HTML or CSS to refer to the particular attribute, that's probably going to be the same thing that you're going to use in in JavaScript. But granted, that takes a little while to get used to and to learn. The big uh, and then there's some more advanced DOM features. The big thing probably for this class will be familiarizing yourself with the with the breadth of, of uh, JavaScript statements that you can encounter. All right, because uh, again, it's a full-blown programming language. You know, anything in any other programming language, JavaScript has ifs, loops, functions, and so on. All right. Question. Would you be able to access like the time on the computer? Yes. Uh -huh. okay. Any event. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For, uh, for example, um, you're asking, can you access a time in any event? You know, you can have timed events. Uh, if you go to Google's Gmail, for example, uh, and if I have my email up now and someone sent me an email, it refreshes the page every certain amount of time. It runs out and looks to see if there's another email, you know, and if there's another email, then it adjusts the HTML. So yeah, it it, it doesn't typically. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't have to be, but again, for the purposes of this class, probably most of the examples we're going to have are going to relate to some sort of interaction. Other questions? All right, that's all I had. We'll see you folks in lab.